I really, uh, you know, always when you're speaking in a synagogue, it's especially if it's uh, out of Israel, you feel something different. It's less obvious than in Israel. I always saying to people that coming from out of Israel, Jews that coming from out of Israel, and they are saying, people are not look like you know, like connecting to the Jewish roots and everything in Israel. Everything is so obvious. I say yes, it's obvious because you live in Israel, and it's obvious you live in Israel. This is a Jewish land, Jewish state, Jewish homeland. You feel Jewish even if you are full secular. You always have the holidays. You always have the the celebration, and you always have the. Uh, religious uh, events, but when you come to a synagogue in the diaspora out of Israel, you feel so Jewish. You feel so Jewish. You feel so connecting to your Jewish roots. And again, thank you for this experience. For me, it's really uh, important. So thank you very much for all this event. Uh, Sam, uh, thank you very much. Where are you? Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for your friendship. And I met you first time at this nice event that, uh, for me, it was amazing to see so many young people, commitment to Israel, with a huge of commitment to Israel. And uh, I am really glad to be your friend. And I hope that we're going to have a, a, a long future together. And of course, I want to... Uh, uh, say thank you to Debbie uh, Farnoosh. She's, she's not here. She's apologized that she didn't reach this event, but uh, I know that she was involved in the organization of everything. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Michael Yedigarian. Yes, I said true. Where, where, where is she? Where is he? Ah, she's not here also. Okay. So thank you. Ah, she's in Israel. Michael in Israel. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I came to United States actually, uh, first of all, because the main reason I am uh, in the Knesset. I'm the chairman of the caucus of uh, encouraging Aliyah from the Western countries. And I'm doing that with the Nefesh Benefesh. Probably you heard about this organization, Nefesh Benefesh, that actually helped uh, helping Jews, Jews that want to come and make Aliyah from North America and, uh, and to help them in all the process of that. And it's amazing. They're doing an amazing job. And I'm working with them and we are helping them, especially in the Knesset, to change and to make some uh, new bills in Israel that can make the Aliyah for these people that are coming from the north of America more easier. In a lot of taxes issue and uh, welfare issues and medical issues and other issues. So we are doing a lot of changes to help them and to make because Aliyah from the north of America and for uh, richest countries is different when it's Aliyah that coming for the uh, other, like, other countries like Russia and others. So this is the main reason that I came. And uh, also all, with, all the time when I'm coming to America, I'm using the time to meet people and to go around and to meet with people from all the Jewish community in America how much I can. Because I believe that if you are seeing yourself, and if you are a national leader in Israel, you should have a good connection with the Jewish diaspora and with the Jewish community. Because I believe we are one. Part of us living in Israel, part of us go, going to live in the future in Israel, but we are one. We have the same future, we have the same destiny. We depend each other. We depend each other. You know exactly that you need a strong Israel. And we know exactly that we need a strong Jewish community in America. And that's why I believe this is my responsibility to work not, not only with the Israeli citizen, also with the Jewish people that live in and living out of Israel. And we're always talking about, and I'm going to talk about the Israeli problem, but I think the Jewish uh, communities have also a problem, that we should help them and we should involve in that. Jewish education. Jewish ed education, I believe, it's, it's, I think, the critical issue that we should invest in. The, I always saying about us, the Jewish people, that the main asset, the important asset that we have, is the Jewish people. The Jewish people have the Jewish people. This is what we have, and we are not a lot. We are not a lot. We cannot afford ourselves to, to lose Jews in the way. And losing Jews in the way 
is Jews that, Jews that are not connecting to the Jewish roots and to the Jewish tradition. And it's not saying it's only to be Dati, to be religion. It's to be connected to the Zionist idea, to Israel, to the Jewish tradition, to the Jewish roots. Because we must keep ourselves. I'm, I'm, I'm strongly uh, believe that for that we should and help and invest in a Jewish education even out of Israel. And I want you to know, uh, when I was in uh, between 2006 and until just now, I was the president of the Zionist Congress. And the last government, Kadima government, was actually the first government that took a decision uh, to help the Jewish communities to keeping the Jewish education system. And I don't know what, how, how much this government continue with that or not, but we believed from the beginning, it was the first time that the Israeli government helping Jewish communities in place that need this help. And some Jewish uh, uh, communities don't have the money, don't have the, the, the possibilities to keep all the Jewish education. And that's why we, we then create a special committee that should help this issue. And I believe it's very uh, critical. As you know, I am from uh, Kadima Party. Uh, I was, as I say, I was one of the pioneers that create Kadima. I had my luck to work with Ariel Sharon. Uh, you know, I'm, for me, Ariel Sharon, I know him first time in something like 99, in Likud, when we was, all of us was in Likud. And I remember when, uh, I remember when all the people, uh, Sharon elected in 99 and support him in, in Likud, inside Likud, in the, in the primaries in Likud. And then in 2001, Netanyahu decided he wants to come back to the political life. And immediately, I cannot forget it, immediately, 90% of the people in Likud replaced their supporting from Sharon to Netanyahu. Everyone left Sharon. Everyone went to support Netanyahu. And I remember, it was midnight. Sharon was sitting in his office after making hundreds of phone calls to the political activist, activist in Likud to tell them, vote for me, help me, I need your help. And people were so ashamed to speak with them that they ended up the phone. They didn't want to talk with him. And I remember I came, I, 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 was, I, coming, I came to him and I told him, uh, listen, uh, Arik, Arik Sharon, I said, listen, I, I was then the chairman of the youth movement of Beitar. And I told them, listen, I'm going to give you all the structure that we have in Beitar. I'm going, I'm going to give you the, the cell phones, the cars, the, our uh, branches, our building, whatever you need for your primaries, for your election. And I remember, he looked at me and he said, We've been, I, I was me, him, and Uri Shani, that was his uh, CEO. And, and he said, it, it, Sharon told me, Yoel, you know that we are going to lose in this election. So what are you doing to yourself? You can damage from that. You can have a damage from that, political damage. I remember I told Sharon, listen, Arik, I'm young. I can survive that. I am with you. I believe in you. I believe that you are the right, uh, the right candidate for the prime minister position. I am with you. The history was the day after, thank God, Netanyahu decided not to run inside the Likud election. And Sharon, three months after that, became to be the prime minister of Israel. And three months after that, I came with him to be advisor to him in the prime minister office. And I can tell you, you have your life before you worked in the Prime Minister office, and you have your life after you worked in the Prime Minister office. Because to be in the Prime Minister office in Israel is to see everything. Is to see everything, is to know everything, and even it's amazing because in my first term when I was a member of Knesset, I said to my, to my friend that it's weird because when I was advisor to the Prime Minister, I had more information and knowledge than I have now as a member of Knesset. Because when you work with the Prime Minister and you see everything and you see all the material and you see all the challenges and you see 
how much is such a complicated issue, how much is complicated to be a Prime Minister of Israel. And Sharon was in a very dynamic time, and he took the difficult decision to uh, pull out from Gaza. And what was amazing, and I remember that very well, when I was coming back, Usually it was after midnight, something like that. I remember I find all the time my neighbors with their dogs or something like that. Always they wanted to shake my hand, say, wow, Arik Sharon is the king. We support him. We think he's amazing. He had a huge support in the Israeli public. But when I went to the party center of Likud, he was like the enemy of the public. He was like the enemy of the public. I said, what happened here? It's crazy. You have a leader that everyone wants, and you are killing him. And I'm telling you, the decision to create Kadima was a very difficult decision for Sharon. I know it very well. For him, it was a very difficult decision to go out and to divide Likud. But he believed that the only way to make sure that we are dealing only with what is good for Israel and what, what is good to politics is to create a new center party in Israel. Unfortunately, he got sick and he didn't, was, he didn't actually lead the party. But still, with all the things that we have, today Kadima is the biggest party, after two elections, the biggest party in Israel. And what is amazing, you know, one year ago, the, one year ago, the Tel Aviv University, if I remember well, if it was Tel Aviv, I'm not so sure, uh, I think it's not, it was not Tel Aviv, I don't remember well now. Uh, some of the universities in Israel create or make a special research about public opinion about, of, of the Israelis, about politics, about all the core issues. And they took the platform of Kadima, the platform of Likud, and the platform of Labour. They give it to the people but without the name of the leader, without the name of the, uh, of the party, and they just ask the choosing people, chosen people to tell them what, what the most of the, what, what you support, what kind of platform we support from all the three of them. Kadima platform got between 60% to 75% support. Without the people knew that this is Kadima uh, a platform. Because I think the combination of the Kadima policy is in one end, in one side, <coughs> to go to the two-state solution, not because of the Palestinians, because of us, because of the demographic issue, but in the other side, to be tough enough. Thank you. Ah, great. Thank you very much. But in the other side, to be tough enough against terror, not to be weak against our enemy, fight against terror, keeping the security of Israel. And this is, I think, the, the right combination that the Israeli people support. Today, Kadima is in the opposition, as you know. We are in the opposition. Actually, it's crazy. Only in Israel you can win in the election, but find yourself in the, in the opposition. This is only the Israeli crazy political system. But this is the reality, and I think we took the right decision not to join to the government. Because from the first time, when we came and met with Netanyahu after the election, Netanyahu always said to Kadima, you can join, you can join to my 61 member of Knesset coalition, under what I agree before the election. And I say, if we want to make the change, if we want to be part of a, a good government that makes the big changes, how we can do it with such a, such a commitment that he have to Shas, to Lieberman Party, to all these parties, how we can make the change. And we told Netanyahu from the beginning, if you want to have a real united government that can make the change, you should create a government that based by Kadima and Likud, agree about all the principles of this government and all the way of this government and then all other parties can join, join to the government under this condition. 
This is the way that created United, Gov United Government in Israel in the past. But Netanyahu, and this is the reason that he had his government, have commitment before the election. He, he gave commitment to Shas, and he gave other promises to other party, and he didn't have any actually way to go out from that, to, run, to, 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 to come back from these this, um, promises. And we went to the opposition. First of all, I think it's important that today in Israel you have opposition and a, a strong coalition and a strong opposition. It's not bad for the Israeli democracy. It's even good. If you ask me if it's good for Israel, it's not good for Israel. It's not good for Israel because today, in this Knesset, first time after a lot, a lot of years, in this time, first time we have a majority for a very critical reform in Israel. As example, for the electoral reform in Israel. The electoral in reform in Israel is really, really necessary. You cannot actually run this country with this system. I'm telling you, I was the head of the coalition, I worked with the prime minister, I, I know everything. Even if you are choosing to be the prime minister, you chose to be the prime minister, you don't, you have a lot of difficulties to rule. You know that every Monday, the Prime, of, the Prime Minister of Israel needs to pass the vote of confidence. Every Monday. And you're saying to yourself, okay, it's not a problem because, because you have the majority, you have the coalition. But I'm telling you, it's a coalition only on the paper. If, let's say that you have 67 members of Knesset that support in your government. Do you think that every Monday they're supporting the government? You need to promise them things, you need to make sure. You know, I remember when I was the head of the coalition, it's like the um, a majority leader. I remember always I had a meeting with the prime minister on Thursday. We, have all, we had all the weekend to make sure that we have the majority. Until Monday morning, everything looked very nice. We have the majority. But suddenly, in Monday morning, all the crisis begin. He won that. And he have this bill, and he don't want, and we, uh, some of them disappears. We don't. Every Monday, the same story until the vote, until six o'clock, five minutes before six o'clock, you don't know what's going to be the result of this vote. It's crazy. You cannot actually run a country like that. So first time in this Knesset, we have a majority for two main changes that we want to make. First of one, first of the first and the important one is that is actually give us a reality that we can minimize the number of the parties in Israel. And it's saying that we should raise the, the minimum percent that you need to get into the parliament. Today you need only two seats. We say you should have four or five seats minimum. If you're going to five or four seats minimum, you are making the parties to go to, together to United. And then you can minimize the number of the parties from 12, 14, what we have today, to 6, 7, or 8. And it's critical and important. The second change that we need to do, very simple. And we said it before the last election. And we're not saying that only because of this election. The second change, important change is that saying that the leader that got the most of the votes in the election automatically became to be the Prime Minister of Israel. Automatically, without any need of coalition, without any necessary to get the proof from the President, automatically. What it gives us? No more uh, 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 pressures on you, no more agreements, no more promises. Everyone understands that you are the Prime Minister, so they must come and be part of your coalition. They are not controlling you. You don't need them. And we said from the beginning that this is the right way to do it. Before you're making the big changes that we are I, I against doing immediately biggest, big changes. You, sh you should do it step by step. And this is the first thing that we should do. And today we have majority. Likud support that, Labour support that, Kadima support that, and Lieberman support that. It's a huge majority in the Knesset. Why it's not happening? Because Netanyahu is commitment to Shas, have commitment to Shas. 
and Shas against that. And the other parties, against, smaller party, of course, against that. So we are losing amazing opportunity until now to making these changes. And I still hope, I don't know, I still hope that before we are finished this term of this Knesset, maybe in the last few months that we have, going to have in, near the election, we're going to do it. It's very, very important for us. And it's critical, I'm telling you, for the stability and for the possibility of the Israeli leaders to deal with the huge challenges that we have. Um, I want to speak about our uh, situation in the world today and all the Palestinian issue and Iran issue and all that. Uh, first of all, I want to say something about why, why I uh, decide and why I'm supporting today uh, the two-state solution. And I want you to know, I believe that we are the Jewish people and the Israelis. We have the full rights on all Eretz Israel. No doubt about that. We have a full right on all Eretz Israel. And when today we are coming and saying that we should compromise, it's not because we don't have rights. It's not because it's not, it's not belong to us. For me, it's only because one, one reason. I have the responsibility to keep Israel and to make sure that Israel exists for good with the Jewish majority and as the Jewish homeland for the Jewish people. That's all. This is the, the main responsibility that all of us have. And if we are not going to take a decision, what is our final borders, we can find ourselves one day dealing with a request or demand or demand of one state for two people. And I'm telling you, more and more Palestinians talking about that today. If we are not going to make the compromises, and we have the red lines, and I'm going to talk about the red lines, but first of all, I'm coming for the two-state solution only because the demographic issue. I prefer to have a smaller country but the Jewish states for good, with the Jewish majority by democracy way. This is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. And I, I, I'm telling you, we are losing time. I'm really worried from that. It's not only because of us, of course. The Palestinian more than once didn't have the brave, didn't was brave enough to take the, the brave decision. Actually, I believe that we had all the time the brave leaders. The Palestinians never had the brave leaders. But still, this is our responsibility. This is what we need to do for ourselves. And we have our red lines. As example, the Palestinians have the demand of, probably you know, the right of return. You all know what is the demand of right of return. It's talking about the refugees that left in 48, and the Palestinians actually want them to uh, come back again uh, after the two-state solution. And this is something that I'm not understanding. Because if we decide to go to the two-state solution, and if we decide to divide the country to the Jewish states and the Palestinian states, why the Palestinian refugees want to come back to the Jewish states if they're going to have the independent states? This is their solution. This is the solution. This is something that you have a full consensus in Israel. We are full against that. For me, if it's going to be the condition for agreement, no agreement. I'm against any refugees that can come back to the Jewish state, to Israel, after the agreement of two-state solution. It's against all what we believe. If we divide the state, let the Jewish people live in the Jewish states, let the Palestinians live in the Palestinian state. And this is something that I think it's, have, as I said, a consensus between, I think, most of the political leaders in Israel, and this is something that we, should, we all should be 
very, um, uh, very connected to that and very uh, strong against that. Also, we said very clearly in Kadima, from the beginning, we said about the main Jewish blocks, like Malay Dumim, like Ariel, like Gush Etzion, like all these places, in any agreement, staying under Israeli control. And I want you to know, that from the, for, for the Palestinians, it's obvious. The, the, all the draft that was between Abu Mazen and Olmert and Livni and others was under this uh, agreement, under this agree of, of keeping these main Jewish blocks under Israeli control in any, in any uh, agreement. And this is important, first of all, because we want to keep this area, and secondly, because it's, I believe, a place that most of the citizens there, most of the people that live in there, they are Jewish, a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people, that live, Israelis that live in there, you cannot evacuate these places, so no doubt about that. And of course you have the question of Jerusalem. About Jerusalem I want to tell you something. You don't have in Israel any conflict, not inside Israel, and not between Israel and the Palestinians, about the Arab neighborhood. Most of the Arab neighborhood in any agreement in Jerusalem, they are not part of Jerusalem, they are not going to be part of Jerusalem. Because of demographic solution. The main problem with Jerusalem, and this is the main issue, let's say that tomorrow, some Israeli government going to say to the Palestinian, listen, you're going to get now full all the Arab neighborhood around Jerusalem. You think it's the end of the story? Of course not. The Palestinians actually talking about controlling about all the religious places, all the, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, Arabites. How are we saying? Yeah. Dome of Rock, yeah. All these places and they want control there. It cannot be. It cannot be because I believe that if you are, you know, I, I think you can put this area and you can decide this is an international area, open for everybody, everyone can get in, just with security check and everything, for all the religions, like today, maybe even more. But we never should compromise about controlling this area. Because I'm telling you, if we are losing the control of this area, we're going to make Jerusalem one of the violent cities in the world. The only states, the only country that, that, that can keep this area open and safe for all the religious, it's Israel. We can cooperate with other governments, with other forces, but still, the control should stay by the Israeli government. I believe that any other solution can actually destroy Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is a very big issue, and I, I, I'm, I'm not be, I don't believe that it, this is something that we should talk tomorrow. We can leave it for, the, for, the, for, to, for tomorrow. What is important is continuing speaking and making the separation between us and the Palestinians. And more or less you have this separation. You have the fence that actually separate between us and the Palestinians, and we should keep it and try to have an agreement. I, and I want you to know, the situation today in the West Bank is different than the situation in Gaza. Gaza, as you know, controlling by Hamas. West Bank controlling by Fatah. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons why Fatah is still controlling uh, West Bank is because of Israel. Because of the good cooperation that we have between us and the and Abu Mazen regime. To keep the security in all this area, not, not giving the the terror organization to raise their head in these places, and we succeed, not bad. And the situation of the people that live in the West Bank is better in a, an economic issue, an education issue, in all the issues actually. We minimize the checkpoints. This is, there was the Kadima policy, and I understand that this government continue with that. The new government continue with that. But still the problem is today and I believe this is our problem, that we don't have today a direct negotiation with the Palestinians. And I want you to know something. When I'm going abroad, you know, when I'm in the opposition, I, I know, know 
one of the members of Knesset that criticized very strongly the Prime Minister, Netanyahu. But I'm doing that only in Israel. Outside of Israel, I'm speaking, especially if I speak with formal people or something like that, I represent the government because the government is my country. The policy of the government outside, for me, I should represent her. But here I believe I can speak more freely. I believe. I hope. I can. <laughs> Tamar, don't tell Netanyahu nothing. <laughs> you know, something about Netanyahu, I, uh, Sam, you didn't uh, say that to the people, I am also the chairman of the state control committee in the Knesset. Actually, it's one of the stronger committee in the Knesset that all by, all by opposition uh, delegate all the time. And it's like, it's like uh, a Senate committee. It's the only committee that can actually criticize and control and follow up the government action. And it's the only, only committee in the Knesset that if I ask somebody to come to te give a testimony or something, he must come by law. If not, he can get subpoena for me. He must come. How many subpoena we gave from the beginning of this of Israel until now? You think? Many, you say? I'm, I'm. Zero? Who say zero? Zero? Somebody else? Zero. Never. Nobody actually refused. They don't want to come. Believe me, they don't want to come. But they must come. And the and it's from the prime minister until the last bureaucrats in the Israeli system. And they don't want to come. Three months ago, uh, three weeks ago, the Prime Minister Netanyahu came to my committee. He didn't want to come, but he didn't have any choice to come. He must come. So he came, and we have some discussion about something. And I told him that I was, uh, I told him that months ago I'd been in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. And I had a meeting with the foreign minister. Deputy Foreign Minister, I'm sorry, Deputy uh, Foreign Minister, and we, and it was with me somebody from the Likud party. And I start to explain the Israeli policy and to explain what we do after the flotilla, after the, the, about the blockade, about all the issues. After 20 minutes that I spoke with him, I gave a speech there and I explained to him, the, the member of Knesset from Likud told me after that, you spoke like a government, uh, like a minister, like you represent the government. Why are you not speaking like that in the Knesset? <laughs> I said, listen, this is outside. I'm doing, you know, for the country. Inside, I have a lot of criticized criticism to say, and I'm doing that very, as you know, very well. So I told it to the prime minister. He said, wow, he didn't believe. He spoke with that about people. You know, Yol Hassan, talk for us. And he said that, he said that. I said to Netanyahu, the prime minister, listen, prime minister, in a bro out of Israel, you don't have opposition. And, uh, but still, I can hear, t I believe, can speak more freely. And I can tell you that it was a huge mistake of Netanyahu, one day after he elected, not going to Obama and saying automatically, I'm continuing with direct negotiations. That's all. Nobody asked him to say that he compromised about something. Nobody asked him for him. Not, uh, nobody asked him to, to withdraw or to do something. Just said to Obama, I'm continuing with the direct negotiations. You know, Abu Mazen, in the Kadima time, every Friday, he came to the prime minister res resident to uh, negotiate with Israel. We never freezed the building in Jerusalem, the building in Jerusalem. We never freeze the building uh, in the main Jewish blocks. We never give any, we never, give, we never actually paid any price for making the negotiation with, with, with Abu Mazen. And actually Abu Mazen never demand that, never ask for that. But today after Obama asked for Israel, what do you expect from, uh, from Abu Mazen to be less than Obama? So he must now to be more tough with Israel. And you know what was? Uh, the huge mistake of that, the result of this mistake, that after five, six years, that the international community actually didn't was any ish, didn't actually was caring about what happened with the Palestinian negotiation because they, they saw that everything worked very well and we have the negotiation and we have this a positive, a positive attitude of the Israeli government for the peace process. So if it was a blame on, on somebody, it was on the Palestinians. With full, full 
this is the full truth. But today, the blame comes back again to Israel. Israel looks like they are the, we are refusing to go to negotiation with the Palestinians. And if you ask me, today, even today, still the Palestinians have the full blame on that. Because they are not ready, because they are not brave enough. Because if you take the speeches of Abu Mazen in English, and the speech of Abu Mazen in Arabic, it's a different speeches. And you cannot actually prepare your people for peace if you are not educating them for peace. If you are not explain them and tell them as example as what our leader told us, told us that we're going to have the dream. Maybe not a full dream, but we're going to have the dream. And nobody come to the Palestinian people and tell them, listen, we are not going to get everything, but we're going to have independent states. Different, different speeches in Arabic, but now nobody listening to that. Because Israel looks like the, the obstacle, that making and putting all the obstacle. And I hope that the second meeting or the third meeting that was, in Oba with, that was with Obama and Netanyahu, I hope it was a better uh, meeting than, in, than, than that was in the first one because uh, and I hope that we're going to go to negotiation, direct negotiation with the Palestinians because this is our interest, first of all, as I said, because of the separation between us and the Palestinians, and secondly, because of the Iranian issue. When we add all the time, automatically, the negotiation with the Palestinians, the full focus was on all the Iranian issues. Today, the focus come back to the Palestinian issue. And we don't want it. Because we all know more or less what's going to be the solution. This is not our problem anymore. Our real problem is how to avoid Iran to have the nuclear weapon. This is the main issue and the main pro project that we all have. And this is not only our project. I believe this is an international project. Of course, it's an Israeli pro a project. And it's also a Jewish project to avoid Iran to have the nuclear weapon. And Iran wants to have the nuclear weapon. Let's say they're going to have it. I hope not, but let's say. Don't think that they're going to use it day after. They're not going to use it so fast. They know what's going to be the price of that. They want the nuclear weapon not only to use it, they want to, the influence. They want actually to control the Middle East and to say as example to Syria, you cannot sign a peace agreement with Israel. If you're going to do it, you know what's going to be the price of that. And they can say to Egypt, if you are not canceling the peace agreement with Israel, you know what can happen to you. And they can actually create and create the main and the biggest terror organization in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. After Iraq, uh, after America going to withdraw from there, Iran with a nuclear weapon can become the king of the Middle East. The king of the Middle East. And you don't want regime regime like that become to be the king of the Middle East. And that's why all our efforts as a nation must be how to avoid Iran to have the nuclear weapon. That's what we need to do, all of us. You have your influence. You are close very much to, to the congressmen, to senators. You can be influenced. Of, of course, America is very important. Actually, she is the leader of that. We believe in the sanction. It should be more. It should be more stronger. It should be always update, because Iran have the way to avoid from this sanction. So it always should be update, and, uh, but with limited time. If we're going to see that it's not working anymore, we should do something. And again, not only Israel. Not only Israel. I, I strongly believe this is not only Israeli problem. You know, I, a few months ago, I had a, a mem some group of members of uh, parliament from uh, Russia. 
and they explained me, explained me how much they have interest in Iran and they have uh, economic interest and all the oil issues and all that and they invest a lot of money there. So I told them, listen, you afraid for your investments? I'm telling you, if Iran is going to have the nuclear weapon, it's the end of all your investments. Believe me, more than if they're going to have the nuclear we- don't going to have the nu- nuclear weapon. This is your interest that Iran don't, don't going to have the nuclear weapon. Because I'm telling you, if they're going to have the weapon, the Middle East is going to become and be one of the unstable region again. Even more the unstable than it is today. So this is your interest to do whatever you can to avoid them to have the nuclear weapon. We are in Israel, follow up all the time what is actually happening in Iran. We are always aware, I always saying about Israel, that we are the Israelis. We are living in amazing palace, but in a very bad neighborhood. <laughs> this is actually our reality. So when you live in a neighborhood like that, you should be always aware to your neighbors and to be very careful when you're going out and going around and put your, keeping your fence and your, uh, all your protection very well. And, and that's what we do. And I can tell you, we never, I don't know what's going to be. I opti- optimistic can hope that it's not going to, be, to have a nuclear weapon, but I can tell you, any leader in Israel, no matter if he's from Likud or from Labor, from Labor I cannot imagine, but Likud or Kadima, never going to put the existing of the Jewish people in a risk again. Never. This is something that every, everyone that's sitting in the Prime Minister chair always have in his mind that his responsibility is to keep the safe of the Jewish people. And to keep the safe of Israel is not only to keep the safe of the Israelis, it's also to keep the safe of all Jewish around the world. And, and this is what we have, and that's why we can handle with everything, I believe. We have all the tools, we have all the power, we can handle with everything. But still, we believe and you should help us with that. That dealing with Iran, it's not only an Israeli problem. Um, one word before I, I finish to a question and things like that. If you haven't, feel free to ask questions. I think I a lot of time. Flotilla, and about the blockade and all this issue. We got, one year ago, we got a full support from the international community for the operation in Gaza. You remember the big operation in Gaza? We got a full support. All the European leaders came day after the war to support Israel when Israel fight against Hamas. We convinced the world that Hamas is regime, illegitimate regime in, in, in Gaza. And we have a full right to fight against them. In the Kadima time, we have three flotilla that nobody knew about them. Nobody knew nothing about them. The reason that the last flotilla became to be such a news, it's because of the fact that Israel looked like a, a country that putting an obstacle for a peace process. And I always say, it's not always what you do, it's sometimes how you look like. And our interest is always, in one end, to keep our interest and to say very clearly what is our interest and what, what is our condition and what is our, uh, uh, um, our red lines about what is important for us. But in the other side, always be positive for peace. Always be ready to sit with everyone. It's not saying that you are Compromise about your red lines. It's not saying that you're withdrawing from every, every place. It's just saying that you are positive to sit all the time with any enemy. This is what is important to keep. In this way, you can keep better the other Israeli interests. You can have a better image in the world. But I want you to know, I don't have any expectation from the world, you know. This is something that we should say. 
always going to be very terrible for us and a very and a big problem to explain and to you know some it's amazing I, I met with member of parliament all the time they don't understand why we assist to call Israel a Jewish state they don't understand that I always, I don't want to tell them one of them one of the member of parliament was was a, a French guy and I wanted to say you want me to have what you have in your country This is, this is our idea, this is our vision. We are in Israel because this is the homeland of the Jewish people. And you know we are not new here in Israel, I'm telling him. It's, we are not new. If you are digging in the land of Israel, you're finding proof of 3,000 years of Jewish existing in Israel. 3,000 years ago. Nobody can tell us that we are a new citizen there. We've been there from the beginning. You find it in the land when you're digging. So di what, what more proof than that you need to say that, to prove that this is the homeland of the Jewish people. Um, so I want to leave uh, some, some time to question. I want to say finally uh, first of all, again, thank you for listening, and I, I hope and I want to have and keep uh, the connection with you, and especially uh, with the leaders that came to here and with the young generation. I really appreciate the fact that you are encouraged the young generation here, because I'm telling you, I've been in so many amazing and big buildings of Jewish communities that I'm sure the 20, 40 years from now I'm going to be empty because they are not encouraging the young generation to be part of the Jewish activities. And I, I really admire the young people that are sitting here and actually care about that and came and leave everything, left everything and came. It's amazing that it's important for you and please, please continue with that. And um, I hope that you're going to uh, keep in touch with me. I have Debbie Stein that's working with me. Uh, she's helping me in all my projects in the diaspora, all my connection, all my uh, uh, donation collection and everything collection and, and everything. So first of all, I hope to have uh, your support in the future and I hope to have your, co your contact with you in the future. And uh, again, I believe that we are one and we should work together and we should keep the main asset of the Jewish people is the Jewish people. So thank you very much. Thank you. What was happening behind the scenes from April to, through July what, that we may not know about? Was it really as bad as the press said? And how do you see the status of, of the relationship today between the Obama administration and Israel? Okay. Uh, next question. I want me to answer now. Or you? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, about, uh, um, first of all, I must be honest, I don't know all the details. I don't know what happened in the inside meeting with Obama. I just you know, I came to Obama and told him, listen, I have a new idea. I want to do the things differently. And Obama didn't accept that. Probably Obama was ready to say exactly what he wanted to do. I don't believe that Obama is against Israel. I really don't believe in that. But on the other side, I don't so sure that Obama is seeing Israel in the main priority of, of his policy. His problem cannot compare to President Bush. And what I want to say something about President Bush. I told you that I worked with Prime Minister Sharon, it, most of the time it was with President Bush. I'm telling you, President Bush should have the prize of Israel. I'm serious. I'm serious about it. I know I'm saying that as an Israeli citizen, not as an American. I don't know if he was a good president for America or bad president for America. I don't know. I'm speaking about Israel. And I'm not the, the person that, that should judge that. This is not my, my issue. But as an Israeli, I'm telling you, President Bush helped the security of Israel more than you even imagine. And most of that things that people even don't know. Still secret until now. And I'm telling you that President Bush helped Israel in some critical times. 
that we have been in a very complicated situation. And President Bush gave Israel the full backup. And I know that from inside. So for me, President Bush is a hero. As an Israeli. And probably he came with some, you know, with some belief and with some uh, policy and with some, you know, and, and he was, I'm saying in the positive side, you know, President uh, was a very simple guy, you know, he was divide the world to the bad guys and the good guys. And when you understand that you are the good guys fighting against the bad guys, it's very easy. <laughs> and I'm telling you in the Middle East, this is the way to judge. <laughs> This is the best way to, to, to see that if you are studying, uh, you know, uh, checking too much, you are start to confuse, to be confused. And I'm, I really say that in the positive side. In the positive side. And President Obama probably have a different policy. But still, if you ask me, if the President Obama opinion and policy is to promote the two-state solution and the separation between us and the Palestinians is doing something good to Israel, not bad. I strongly believe in that. If you ask me if it was necessary to make the Israeli government to, make, to pay all these prices of freezing and other building and all this issue, no. It was not necessary. They never asked that from Kadima government. It was not necessary. Even Abu Mazen didn't ask for that. But this is what we have today. I hope for Israel that the last meeting between Obama and, and, and Netanyahu was a good meeting. And I hope that from now we're going to get into a new relationships. It's good for us. It's important for us. And uh, we wait and see. Thank you so much for joining us. You're, you're a great strategic thinker, and I really enjoyed a lot, of, a lot of what you had to say in like a geostrategic sense of it. My question for you is, um, Israel has been slammed with four attacks in five days, right? So you had, a, starting Friday, you had a, a missiles landing in Ashkelon, you had rockets exploding in Elat, being shot from the from Sinai. You had uh, rockets over Sderot, but you know, that that's not something too new and um, as you know as, as we all know probably you had the Lebanese army opening fire and killing one Israeli soldier who was on reserve um, within Israeli territory and they were just clearing trees so my question for you is uh, do you interpret these as sort of isolated incidents? Should we really be concerned about them? Um, and just in general, you know, today the U.S. State Department, for example, slammed what the Lebanese did. They said it was unjustified. They said it was unwarranted. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about it. I think a lot of people here are a little bit concerned about it. Ashkelon being hit a lot, you know, it's, it's really unsettling. So um, my question for you is, do you think we're being Israel's being provoked, possibly dragged into some battle, if not war soon? And should Israel be practicing more restraint so far? They've just had one strike in Gaza, you know, that's it. H how do we interpret what's been happening? Four attacks fi in five days. Okay. Uh, we should be concerned from what happened, no doubt about that. We should be aware to the changes that we have today, in the, especially in the uh, border in the north of Israel. Uh, it's obvious that we have uh, some, some uh, tense between leaders, Arab leaders, in, in the country that our neighbors in the north of Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Hezbollah, uh, probably they have some uh, uh, tense between some leaders and I think we are paying the price of that. I still believe that today, not Syria and not Hezbollah and not uh, Lebanon, of course, don't have any interest to start a new war in Israel, with Israel. I strongly believe in that, uh, and uh, don't have any interest for that, to do that. But I saw many times that even that you don't have the interest, you find yourself in a war. 
So we should be very aware to what happened in the north of Israel. We are aware for that. I just got two days before updates about what, uh, what happened there and what actually uh, we are doing today. We didn't want to increase the, the tense between us and, and Lebanon, of course. It was the first time that Lebanon soldiers attacked Israel. First time, usually it's only a Hezbollah or terror organization, never the formal army of Lebanon. So we see it very, uh, as a very uh, uh, problematic uh, thing. But still, we should follow up that. Uh, we should make sure that it's not getting more than what we see. And again, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned from that, but I'm, in one side, I'm, I, it's for me it's something that we're not so surprised. We are checking that, we are follow up that, we make sure that it's not going more than what we saw, but this is part of our reality. But again, we said very clearly from the beginning, we're never going to stop the things that we are doing every day in this border. You know, the main mess was because Israel asked to do what we are doing all the time, to check the border. And first time, the Lebanon uh, government, the Lebanon army said, you cannot do that. And we said, we are going to do it. And we did that. And we continue one day after to continue and doing all the checking in the, in the border to make sure and, and, and to, to keep the, the border quiet. So we are continuing with all the activities that we are doing. We are aware for that. And about Aza, the road, all the south of Israel, Gaza, sorry, Gaza, the road, a lot, all this, this is the area of the south of Israel. Listen, we have a terror organization that control Gaza today. We don't have any expectation from them. We are seeing them as a full enemy. They are not even like Lebanon, that we don't have any peace with them. They are not even like Syria, that we don't have any peace with them. Because this is a country. They are commitment to, have commitments to agreement, to international agreement, to international law. It's different. Gaza, it's like a war zone. It's something else. It's controlling by terror organization. They can do tomorrow whatever they want. But again, we have all the information that Hamas, in that Hamas leadership, after what we did to them in the last operation, don't want to get into another war with Israel. Again, they don't want to, to be in this situation. If they're not bringing more missiles, they're bringing more missiles and more weapons and more from everything. Syria also doing that. Hezbollah also doing that. Actually, it's not new. They're doing that all the time. The idea is as you keep the balance between you and them. And you're keeping a, 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 a very uh, a price uh, that what's going to be if you're going to attack. And most of the time we, we succeed to create this, uh, uh, this minimum, minimum price that they understand and then they are not starting any war or any attack. But again, sometimes it's changing. We should be aware to that, but it should not uh, prove that something else is going to happen. Again, maybe, maybe it's, uh, I don't want to say it, but maybe it's uh, always because of the relationship between the leaders, especially in Syria, Hezbollah, and Lebanon, and all this leader relationship between them. You know, we can find ourselves one month from now in a war. It can be. I don't see that today, but it can be. It's not something that's from, from, from out, of, of, out of thinking. But still, I hope it's not going to lead for that. Thank you. Especially uh, Russia seems to be on a mission to slowly rid the world of nuclear weapons. They have cut back their stockpiles, they have made agreements to do so, and they've asked the rest of the world to join them in also slowly r eliminating their nuclear weapons. Why do you think the Why do you think the Israel has not been protected at least verbally in terms of its own nuclear stockpile? Why do you think the Obama administration has not protected Israel in terms of keeping it safe against its neighbors and has asked it to also dismantle the weapon system which keeps it safe? And why? What do you think will be the future in the next ten or twenty years? in terms of keeping Israel safe if this movement toward eliminating nuclear weapons actually does achieve momentum? I don't want to speak too much about this issue. I, I must say that I was very happy to hear President Obama speaking about 
uh, about the right of Israel to have the tools to protect herself. Uh, and and, and th I think it's a good policy of America. I think America making the separation between us and other country. And I don't want to talk too much about this issue. Okay. So a two-part question for you, and then we can open it up to the audience. One is a sort of a serious one. I think it's very, very important, especially for us as an American Jewish audience. And the second one, we'll keep it a little light. I already sort of test ran it by you in the reception. Um, Around the world, but especially here in the States, one of the biggest issues that Jews have when it comes to defending is Israel and um, doing like citizen public diplomacy as a citizen ambassador for Israel, I've experienced that I know a lot of my young friends in my generation have, is when you're faced with that question of, and I think it's, it's a very big framing question, it's what the current administration has also decided to emphasize is the settlements, the settlements. If Israel only dismantled the settlements. Um, I'm, settlements, yes. Set, yes. You know, I, I myself have been asked this, and it, it's, it's one of these difficult issues. And the concern um, I think a lot of us have is that it's starting to be actually like a super legitimate issue, or at least it's being framed that way. So that when people are like us are asked the hard questions about Israel, sometimes we ourselves find yeah. to be in like a hard place about it, you know? And the second question is, um, we would love to hear if you have some insider stories about Ariel Sharon, you know, the, the man, the, the legend, and uh, anything insider personal that you want to share about that, and maybe even if, if he were more active today, the world that he sees today. But, you know, you can feel free to keep it as light as you want about that. So, that's it. Settlements. Listen. I think the raising of the settlements issue was one of the successful uh, propaganda of the Palestinians against Israel. We proved more than once that, uh, that settlements never was obstacle for peace. We pr uh, proved more than once that we evocate people for peace and for agreements. And using this issue of settlements as an obstacle for peace that coming from Israel, it's cooperating with, uh, with uh, uh, the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian uh, propaganda. It never was an obstacle. It's only one of the excuses of the Palestinians that never get into a direct negotiation or, or to a, a solution. Uh, that's all. With, first of all, the old Israeli government in the last 10 or 12 years actually didn't continue to build in a smaller uh, settlements and actually stopped to develop the smaller settlements that we all know that in any agreement don't, be, don't going to be part of Israel. The more of the buildings was in the main Jewish blocks in Jerusalem, in a place that we all know that in any agreement going to stay under Israeli control. So using the, uh, uh, using the issues of settlements is just excuse and just way to, to, to put the blame on, on Israel and, and that's what we should explain and say only one thing. Israel proves from the agreement in, with, with Egypt until today that she was ready to evacuate uh, uh, evocate uh, uh, our people and settlements for peace and for agreement and for changing reality. That's why it's not an obstacle, it's not an issue. And, uh, and I must say, I'm, I'm, you, know, you know it's funny because today you have in Israel a, a right government that paid prices that even a left government never, le never paid. Even the Labour government of Yitzhak Rabin, late Yitzhak Rabin, never paid prices like today. Never. So it's, it's amazing to see that, that you have today a right government that needed to pay such a price as like that. And I believe, you know, what is said in my eyes, the fact that because of all this mess, today the world don't make the separation between Ariel and small settlement, like Migron. Everyone knows 
we all know that Ariel is Ariel, and Gush Etzion is Gush Etzion, and Maalei Dumim is Maalei Dumim. You cannot compare it to Maalei Michmash, or to Migrua, I don't know if you know these places, a small settlements with, with few families. But today, in the eyes of the, Jewish, of the international community, they are the same. And it's a huge mistake. In our time, it was not as the same anymore. We convinced the world, including Europe, that the Jewish, the main Jewish blocs going to stay under Israeli control in any agreement that you should be making the separation between these places to other places. And we succeed with that. And now we come back again uh, to a reality that it's bad for Israel. And again, I hope that it's going to change it and they're going to understand it because uh, I believe even us in Kadima believe that we should keep uh, the, Jewish, the main Jewish blocks in any agreement between, between us and the Palestinians. About Ariel Sharon, uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we have a full of stories with him. And uh, we had, uh, I really had got amazing opportunity to work with, with a leader like that. You know, it was amazing because when I was his advisor, I was in the middle of my study in the uh, IDC. It's a private university in Ercelia. And I remember I had one of, the, of, my, one of my course was uh, the name of national security. And it's, uh, you learn about national security, uh, very long course and very important lessons and, uh, and, and with a good lecture and everything. And it was amazing. I, I got all the material that I need to, to read and I need to know. And I read about Napoleon, I read about other big commanders in world uh, armies and the really amazing commanders. And I learned about Ariel Sharon. In the same course, so I said to myself, i working for him? It's like working for a figure from history. You know, and I, I learn about him, and then after, day after, I see him in the, in, in my, in the, in the office. You know, like every day. It was amazing, and, and I said, I got, I got such a luck to work with a, with, with a leader like Ariel Sharon. And I remember, one day we've been in the Prime Minister resident, and suddenly in 10, 10, 10, in, 10 o'clock in the night, uh, the, some soldier came that working in the, with the Army secure, uh, Secretary of, of the Prime Minister, and gave the Prime Minister uh, uh, some paper. And it was an uh, update about something that happened in the, in the, in the West Bank. Uh, four soldiers uh, were shot in by, by, by terrorists uh, in, in, the, in one of the checkpoints. And I remember we've been in the middle of political event with food, with everything. And through the meeting, he got all the information. More and more information, what happened about four, four soldiers died and this and that. And it continued like nothing happened. Just give all the time orders, wrote orders to the, to the soldier to give to the army, but continue like nothing happened. Forty minutes after that, after it's, all the event is finished, until then all the army came and all the people, Sharon got all the information, and he wanted to understand what actually happened. And he learned that actually the terrorists succeed to shoot the soldier before the soldier even did something, respond or did something. And it's killed him. And it's killed him that there never was a fight between them. That the terrorists killed them like, uh, you know, without the soldier even have the time to respond. And I remember Sharon never relaxed until our securities find these four terrorists, four or five terrorists. And he find them, finally. He never actually was relaxing until he find these terrorists that was involved in this, uh, in this uh, event. And I think this is represent what Sharon always believed. He believed that the Jewish people should always have the possibility to protect themselves and to respond and to give fight back, to always fight back. 
Never go like nothing. Always fight back. If somebody come against you, you should fight back. And, and, and this is some of the times that you see a leader that in one time he should act like a normal, like nothing happened. But in the other side, after everything finished, he know exactly what he should do. And he know exactly what, as a leader, he should do. And Sharon, what was amazing with him, that he felt not only the leader of the Israelis, he felt the leader of the Jewish people. He felt the leader of the Jewish people. He felt that all the future of all the Jewish people is on his back. And I have another more funny stories, but I don't have time for that, and maybe in a other time. Yes. Uh, I believe that any prime minister and any government in Israel are not going to accept the reality that Iran have a nuclear weapon in the Middle East. That's all. This is my short answer to a long question. Okay, I'm going to take questions from this side. What, what has happened in the past? Um, I don't want to use the word guarantee, but how do you feel comfortable with if there is a two-state solution that Palestinians would be satisfied and they're, they're not going to come back in the, in the future and say, oh, we are not happy, here we go with the fight and wars again? You know, they can always say whatever they want. Uh, <laughs> They have agreement, we have our uh, international guarantee. You know, they, they, it's a risk, you know, but what is the other risk? From the other side, if you are not making the agreement. You know, the Palestinians, if you ask them today, only between you and them, they're going to tell you they don't want to see you in Israel at all. This is their opinion. I don't care. They can w wish whatever they wish. My responsibility is to make sure that their dream is not coming true. That's all. Because it's my interest. Because if I'm not making the separation, listen. If I'm tomorrow going to insist control Nablus in one day, because of my insisting to uh, control Nablus, I'm going to lose my control in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem and in Haifa. Because if, it's very simple, you know, if let's say that today you don't have any separation between us and the Palestinians and all the Palestinian Authority and Israel and everything is one. You know what is the, how many Jews and how many Arabs you have? 60-40. Six, today. 60% Jews, 40% Arabs. What's going to be 20 years from now? The opposite. If it's become the opposite, I'm going to look like the Knesset. I'm not going to, hear, to be here, probably. Maybe somebody else, maybe Nabil, maybe Mahmoud, maybe Hashem, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to invite them, but they're going to be there. It's very simple. It's very simple because what do you think? We can, if we're not making this separation between us and them, you think that everyone going to accept for good that you have a citizen they have right and citizen they don't have right? Maybe it's, maybe it's, it can be, but I think for a long time it cannot be. That's why it's my interest to have the two-state solution. I'm going to fight for that. And even if the Palestinian, listen, it's important to say, even if the Palestinians are going to continue and putting obstacles for the two-state solution, and even if today they're going to say, I don't want the states, I want one state or two people, we're going to fight that, fight against that. We're going to, this is one of the reasons why Sharon agreed finally to build a fence, to create, in effect, separation between us and them. So it can, the separation can continue even without agreement. We have the separation today. Today, regular Palestinians for the West Bank cannot get into Israel anymore. They cannot get in. Five years ago, there was a freeway. Get in, get out, whatever you want. You know how many families of Arabs, Israelis, and Palestinians united when it was not a fence? We changed the bill. They cannot do that anymore. We have the fence. We are trying to protect ourselves for all the way to protect ourselves from changing the demographic map in Israel. 
Remember, this is the base of the issue, keeping Jewish majority in Israel. We have a question from this side. Leah. Vlad Shalit and his release and if he's ever going to be free. I mean, you mentioned uh, Ariel Sharon working so hard capturing the terrorists that killed the Israeli soldier, and they're probably some of the terrorists that are going to be released for Gilad Shalit. How do you feel about that, and do you think there is a chance for his release? About the terrorists that I talked about, they're not alive anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Sharon wants. They didn't want to bring them to prison. They wanted to send them away. Uh, and we send them away, them and others. Uh, about Gilad Shalit, I'm going to start from the, from the end. I believe that Gilad Shalit is going to come back home. I believe in that. Soon than later, okay? I believe in that. I, I know and I agree that we needed, I think, in the first months after he kidnapped, he kidnapped, I believe that we needed to then making a fast uh, action and bring him back. Fortunately, it is not, did not actually happened. Not always because of Israel. We, we, we have the blame on that in some times, but also Hamas, you know, they have a lot of tense between Hamas in da Damascus and Hamas in Gaza. And even Hamas didn't always want to have a deal, to, find, to, to finish a deal, to make a deal, uh, uh, and to, to finish the story. Uh, today, I believe that because of the time and because what happened, I'm ready today to pay a huge price to bring him back. But my opinion, I have one condition. About the killers, about the terrorists, that actually still have the potential to, have, to be involved in terror. My condition, I understand was the last, last government condition, it's, it's one of the conditions today also, is to saying that if we release them, they cannot come in back to the West Bank. And I think it's important. I don't care if they're going to enjoy all their life now in Paris, in Rome, in Gaza, I don't care. I don't want to bring them back to the West Bank, because if I'm bringing the 400 terrorists like that to the West Bank, I'm raising again all the structure of the terror organization of, of Hamas. In, and, and I can actually put in a risk the, the, the regime of the, of the moderate forces in the West Bank. And it's the end of the story. We must consider that. We must, with all the feeling and with all the dream to see Gilad Shalit in Israel. But still, I think it's a legitimate uh, condition and demand from Israel. And I hope that finally it's going to, to be like that. The agreement is going to be like that. I hope. I'm not, I said it was the government uh, policy then, and it's also the policy today. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor and a pleasure to hear you and get all of the insight from you. Um, before I ask my question, I just wanted to refer to something that Arash asked earlier about the a meeting between Netanyahu and uh, President Obama. I actually had, a, I had an opportunity to be at a conference two months ago uh, where um, Ambassador Oren and Attorney General and Dennis Ross and other people were present and my direct question to Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Oren was actually what happened behind the scenes that night because he was present physically when Netanyahu had um, visited the White House. And um, from his response, um, his, uh, Ambassador Oren's response was that Netanyahu was not snubbed because it was never a state visit um, when he came to the, uh, to, to the White House. It was only uh, because Netanyahu was in Washington, D.C. at the time and um, had decided to meet with Obama and Obama had um, you know, given him a little bit of time that was supposed to be five or ten minutes and ended up being two hours. And so that was Ambassador Oren's response, that nothing really bad happened and that he was not walked out, uh, you know, um, Can you President Obama did not walk out or anything of that sort. So, um, so is there a question, uh, if you Yeah, could. sorry. My question, uh, my question is, is um, in regards um, to his approach, President Obama's approach to the Islamic world that is 180 from what 
uh, President Bush had. How much do you think that that's a naive approach of lack of experience? And how much do you think that is actually what he thought, you know, that maybe he should take a different route and go and build these, you know, ties with the Islamic world? Uh, what, what is your opinion regarding that approach? First of all, about the answer of the ambassador, is ambassador. <laughs> what do you expect me to say? And, uh, and uh, I believe that he can tell you things like that because you never worked in the Prime Minister's office. If I was asking him a question like that, probably he cannot give me uh, the same answer. And, and it's okay, he's doing his job. Uh, but but uh, it's obvious that it was a crisis, it's obvious that it was a problem, it's obvious, obvious that they didn't agree about a lot of things. Uh, and, and, and again, I hope for Israel that it changed today. I'm not speaking as an opposition now, I'm speaking as an Israeli citizen. I hope for Israel the relationship that today is today is, is better. I must say that I believe the relationship between Israel and America is stronger more than any Prime Minister and any President of the United States. I really believe in that. We have a full interest full interest that working together, full projects, full, full of a lot that keeping this strong relationship between Israel and America. So I'm optimist in the bottom line and I not believe that one day America can be a big obstacle for Israel or something like that. I, I don't even imagine that. About President Obama and about how we saw, saw the Arab world and everything, he tried. He tried and he never got any answer. Until today, you remember his speech in Egypt, and he was actually asking to make some mechvot. Uh, uh, I forgot how to say mechvot. Mechvot, jesters, jesters. Thank you. Uh, he, he was expecting to have some jesters from the leaders of the Gulf countries and others for Israel and for the Middle East. It never happened until today. I believe that Obama learned an important lesson from that. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important lesson. And uh, I believe it's maybe make, him, maybe make him now to judge the issues differently that he, he judged one year ago. That's it. Yes. I, th I think we have time for two more questions, if that works. Uh, I want to return to the issue of electoral reform. Uh, I was uh, very pleased to hear the, uh, the two reforms that you mentioned. Uh, I was a little disappointed, and I fully support you on that. Uh, I was a little disappointed to hear that um, at least some members of Knesset elected in districts was not among the reforms that, about which there was a consensus. What is, what is the status of that proposal in the Knesset? I think this issue of the district is the next step. You cannot go that first of all. Before you are going to this way, you know, I must tell you as a politician, for me, it's a better way to, to be elected. If I'm going to have a district and I know exactly what, who is my people, and I know exactly that the only thing that I need to do, to do is doing good things for my people, and I know exactly what is the interest of the region and everything, the district and everything, I believe as a politician it's, it's, it's very good. But today to do it before you make the other changes, it can be a mistake exactly what, like we did with the direct election of the Prime Minister then, that it worked very bad. So I believe we should go step by step. And probably after that, after we're going to minimize the number of the party, after we go, we, we're going to make all this coalition issue and everything disappear, and then we create a new atmosphere for, for making these changes, it's a, good, it's a good idea. Also, you should remember something uh, important. I, I support the district idea. Again, not now, but in the future. But still you should remember that Israel is a small country. And still the national interest is more stronger than the local interest. And I want to give you an example. Let's say that tomorrow I was elected to be, uh, myself and others, elected to be the delegate of, of uh, some districts in the, in, the, in the south. And in this area in the south, they have some army bases that actually making a lot of noise and mess to the people that living around, the, around this base. 
And my people starting to push, make a huge pressure on me. And I must fight against that. But on the other side, this is a national interest to keep these places. What am I going to do? I can lose in the election if I'm not going to succeed with that. So again, this is a very simple example, but still, still in Israel, the national interest, the big interest is still something that is big for, from everything. And united everyone usually, most of the time. So that's why I think this is not the first thing that we should do, but probably in the future, it can, be, it can go to this direction. In, in principle, I agree, I accept that. But about when to do it, it's, it's still a question in my eyes. Yes, last solution. solution. But before I'm going to the technical solution, I need to make sure that the regime is different in Gaza. So the first step is changing the reality in Gaza and make sure that the Palestinians have one government that's controlling Gaza and controlling the West Bank. Without that, you, can, without that, you cannot make a real agreement. And this is one of, of the main principles that we should make sure that actually happened, you know, that they're going to have one government that's ruling all the Palestinian territories and, and this is, first of all, this is important. If it's, this, is, this is actually existing, the next step is to make the technical solution. It's only a matter of money and matter of technical issues and you have a full of solution for that. Yes. Mr. Hassan, very well. I have two questions for you. Number one, what if anything is happening with Sibi Livni? If there is any role for her in the future government? Second, uh, what if anything has been done to prevent the Arab members of the Knesset to travel to Arab countries and support them? Uh, okay, I start with the last question. Uh, about the Arab member of Knesset, uh, we had, probably you heard a lot about uh, Mrs. Wabi and the fact that she was part of the flotilla. And I think that this story was a proof that something happened. Something changed and something happened with the, uh, the way that the Arab member of Knesset actually acting. Five, six, seven years ago, usually, they all, they, most of the time they talked. They say, they gave speeches, very tough things, very tough against Israel. But most of the time, 97%, it was only speeches. In the last two, three years, the talk became to be action. And this is something that I believe that should not be connecting if you came from the left, left from the center of, 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 or from the right. You should be aware for that. Because some of them today acting against the basic of existing of the state of Israel and taking part with groups and with organization and with people that actually fighting illegally against the existing of Israel. And you should put a stop to that. And I got full of criticism about what I did as a member of Knesset against Khalil Zuhabi. And I must say that I'm proud of that, proud of that. Because I believe that the fact that in the Knesset, I think from all the party, parties, all criticized Khalil Zuhabi. And all was part of the uh, decision to have some sanction against her. It's proved that we are a democracy. We are a big democracy. I'm telling you Israel, I believe even a more democracy than America. We are a big democracy, but we should be a democracy that know how to protect ourselves. Because you cannot, in the name of democracy, destroy the idea of the country. Even in America, it's not working like that. And I said in my speech in the Knesset, I said, imagine to yourself a con congressman from America that taking a part in some event against American forces in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Tell me, what happened to him one day after? I think he's going to find himself in jail or something like that. Probably. 
Probably. Even if he's not, uh, if he's a uh, Muslim. Okay? Okay. Okay, I don't know. I didn't hear the story. What? She, 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 I'm not speaking about her, but they should have a, a delegate in the Knesset. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. You know, this is something very, very important to say. And I'm saying that all the time uh, directly to the our people that I meet with them. I'm telling them, listen, this is my responsibility to keep the Jewish majority here in Israel and you should not pay a price for that. I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that you're going forever to be a minority. But I want you to feel it as majority. This should be our policy. We have our Arab citizen. I'm telling you, we should give them all the rights like Israel, like Jewish, everything. And you know what? It's working for us. Because if they have more education, they're, they're bringing less children. If they have more money, they have something to lose. They have become part of the society. And if I keep the balance that's saying all the time, 77% Jews, 18% Arabs, and the other, and what left is others, I can be relaxed. Because I'm controlling the state. And they can be a representative sitting in the Knesset. It's okay. But this is my responsibility to keep this majority, and this is also my responsibility to keep them as a minority. And, and that's all. And, and that's, that's what I, I wanted to do, and that's what I'm keeping. What was the second question? Tzipi Livni. Uh, I think uh, I support Tzipi Livni in the primaries inside Kadima, when it was between uh, you know, Mufaz, Mufaz and, uh, and Tzipi Livni. I'm, uh, I think and I still believe that Tzipi Livni is the best leader for Israel. I believe she has all the tools to be a Prime Minister of Israel. I know very, from very close. I'm doing whatever I can to uh, cooperate between her and Mufaz. I think Mufaz is also a great leader. I think he's, I know him, I think, you know, I was, this story about Ariel Sharon, I remember now, when Mufaz came and wanted to come to Likud, Sharon asked me to help him in the first day in, in, the, in politics. And actually I was with him in the day that he signed the, 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 the paper to join to Likud. And I was with him all the time. I think he's a great leader. I think that the combination between Mufaz and Livni is a good combination. I, I hope that they're going to have a better relationship. Today it's not so good, but I hope in the future it's going to be good. The question is not only what Sipi Livni can do in this government. The question is if Kadima should be in this government. And, and the, I think the only way to, to, that, that Kadima can be in the government it's only if we create a new government that based by Likud and Kadima agree about all the principles and the main issues and then ask others to join and to be part of the, of the government. And this is, I think, the way to see uh, Tsipi Livni in a position. Of course, Tsipi Livni, I think, uh, uh, I think Tsipi Livni is, uh, is uh, better candidate or be, a very good candidate to be a foreign minister at least or something like that. But again, I hope to see her the next Prime Minister of Israel and this is what I really want to see. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for your listening, really, you've been very <laughs> kind. Uh, I, hope, I hope it was interesting for you. And uh, outside we have our paper and you can keep in touch with me. Please take my information and can, you can be part of my, uh, uh, my uh, list that I'm sending updates all the time and keep in touch with all the people all the time. And I hope to see you in the future. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>